almost Christmas. Can you believe it? I'll tell you what. Uh, all right, before we get started here, I have to, I have to address something. Um, I was reminded that last week, apparently your pastor made a very foolish prediction. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. And uh, I, I went out on a limb about a particular game and I predicted that uh, my all-time favorite team did not have a chance and would lose and lose royally. And evidently I was wrong. Way wrong. Yes, real tight. However, many of you did not waste a moment chastising me for my apparent lack of faith. I got text after text call, oh, ye of little faith, why, how, you're a pastor. You're, a, you're probably not even a Christian. I got text and calls, so I'm just here, I want to admit it, I own it, I was wrong, but I have never been more happy to be wrong in my life. I just want to say, all right, I just wanted to clear the air and address the elephant in the room. Oh, sorry. Seriously. Y'all, if you didn't get that pun, it's going to be a long sermon. Because it's all downhill from here. That's about the goodest I've got. I'm going to make a shocking statement that's just going to blow your mind. When you go shopping online, in fact, when you do anything online, there is no privacy. Did you know that? Did you know that you are being followed and tracked? And when you go and you like certain things, they start sending you suggestions like, oh, others bought this, right? Yeah. Where's Elliot? Elliot we were, we were, uh, <laughs> we were in my office last week and I'm like, you know that online process, like you're shopping, I'm getting all these ads and stuff. Like, oh yeah, he said, watch this. He gets out his phone and goes, boat, boat, boat. I should buy a boat. You should buy a boat. Let's have boats. I like boats. And we knew within minutes there would be ads and tracking, all kinds of stuff coming to buy a boat. I don't have a boat. I don't even want to, I don't know how to do it. We have very little privacy. I'm not getting into like a big brother thing, but most of you won't be surprised by this, but I was, but Amazon keeps a track of your preferences and your highlights. So if you bought an ebook, and many of us do, ebook owners can mark sentences and highlight favorite passages. Well, guess what? The online retailer can see that. The online retailer knows that and actually makes a note of it because it helps them. And recently, Amazon has released their number one highlights of all the ebooks that have been their bestsellers. So books like Harry Potter series and Pride and Prejudice and The Hunger Games, all these books were listed in their top uh, echelon here, releasing the most highlighted passages. But they also released the most highlighted passage in the Holy Bible. <coughs> Y'all, it was shocking. Because I don't know about you, I expected it to be John 3.16, right? Or maybe the, something poetic like the 23rd Psalm. Or maybe the Lord's Prayer, maybe something out of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, right? Oh, no, no, no. What they picked, the most highlighted verse in all of Scripture was the sixth and seventh verse of Philippians chapter 4. And if you don't remember it, like you don't have the zip code memorized, there it is. Don't worry about anything. But instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's, there it is, his peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your minds as, don't miss that, as you live in Christ Jesus. So this right here should reveal, so actually it should reveal two things. Number one, Amazon knows way too much about our personal lives. But the second thing it reveals is the desperate need for God's peace. We need this today. All you have to do is look around. But look at what God gives you. He guards your hearts. He guards your minds. It's, it's surpassing anything people can understand as long as we are living in Christ Jesus. So today, this is just yet another incredible promise. We're in a series of Advent called The Promise right now. And today we're going to explore the promise of peace. So let me have my volunteer come up today to help me light the second candle, the candle of peace. All right, Devin, yes going up here. In fact, you get to light two candles. We'll light the candle for hope right here. Sorry, let me, I'm going to block the wind here. One more time, do another click. Good job. These torches are so easy now. They just make it so simple to light. <laughs> Good. All right, now you go up here and light this one. All right, now look at mom and dad here as we get a picture. Hey! You can hold it next to that flame there, and it will relight. To 
Today we have the candles representing hope and peace. Good job. Thank you, Devin. Give him a hand. Each week we move a, a week closer to the arrival of the Christ child. And as you look around today, I think we can all agree that we are in desperate need of peace. Not the shallow temporary peace, not a little feel good, not a, oh, all my problems are solved so I feel peaceful. Oh, no, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the peace that passes all understanding that can only come from walking with the Prince of Peace. And many of you are nodding because maybe you've been through the valley and you know that the Prince of Peace held your hand. And it is the only thing that sustained us. Now, y'all know how much I love shopping, especially this time of year. It ranks right up there with bad drivers with me and traffic because there's all the lines, right? There's all the, the people chaosing and, and elbowing. And you see, like, these doorbuster sales, people getting up in the middle of the night to get these things. And Black Friday, which is ridiculous to me, when people trample others for cheap goods mere hours after being thankful for what they already have. And we look and we see this, and sometimes it escalates quickly. And they're shouting and shoving in chaos. And what was once a fun adventure has now turned into a desperate, frantic retreat to safety. <laughs> and I wish I could say, like humorously, just laugh this off like this was an isolated event. But it's not. People are hurting. People are desperately trying to fill that void with everything but the Prince of Peace. How is it that we have juxtaposed next to the joy and peace we want in Christmas with so much anger and frustration? You know how? It's our fallen nature. And there's people who don't know the Lord out there. and Far too often we're looking for peace. Everybody says they want it, but conflict is what we get. But I want to remind us, as we look back into the past and the promises from Isaiah, this is nothing new. So don't be longing for the good old days. Don't be thinking that the world is out of control or spinning off its axis and the Prince of Peace has kind of maybe lost his footing a little bit and he's not quite able to keep the world spinning. Nothing has escaped his knowledge. You're not alone. You haven't been abandoned. Even back in the Old Testament, we see nothing but struggle and we see chaos and conflict. The Old Testament's full of God's people who are under siege by certain governments or exiled to evil foreign countries or enslaved to all these empires. The Old Testament writers, just like you, just like me, were crying out, God, where is the peace? And one of the prophetic promises found in the book of Isaiah addresses this need for a new leader, this craving. Where is the Prince of Peace? Where is it? We sang about it today when Jason was leading. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, where are you? You can almost hear the longing in that song because they believed God was faithful. They knew he would keep his promises. And so they were eager and they were looking forward, waiting for God to send them the rescue. Today we're going to look at probably one of the more well-known prophecies from Isaiah. It's in chapter 9. And I'm going to use the NLT because I want us to use a slightly different version than what we've memorized because it doesn't need to roll off our tongue. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Next slide. Do we have one of those? His government and its peace will never end, and he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. This is a promise. This is a promise of God, a savior. He's going to usher in a new era of peace. And apparently, his peaceful government will have no end. Yeah, some of you are thinking the same thing I am. You think of government, you picture what we have today. A secular foreign government around the world, we see people who, who may mean well. We automatically think of all the problems that, that we have. And then we read, and that government's going to last forever. <laughs> You're like, yes. More please? No. It's nothing like that. What is to come? Let me assure you, it is nothing like that. The promise says we will be led by a child who is born, grows to become this wonderful counselor, a mighty king, everlasting father. He will rule and reign in righteousness forever. But remember... Just like today, peace is not the reality that they saw, but it gave them hope. The Jewish people were reminded God has not forgotten about them. And maybe somebody needs to hear that, whether you're listening online or whether you're here today and you kind of snuck in the back. We were trying to add extra chairs, and we bought some more that are right around this corner. We're going to have a chair assembly party, okay? So bring your screwdrivers here. See Jason about that. <clears throat> Surprise. <laughs> we have this desperate need for peace. And we look around and we see the brokenness 
of a broken world. And we see right here in our backyard the impacts of global pandemics and wars, and sometimes it's closer to home and our own families being at odds with each other. And we can relate to the people, to God's chosen, who were longing for a ruler. Please bring order out of the chaos. Please make all things right again. And if we're honest, we long to see this peace. We long to see God fulfill his promise of the one who will rule with love and compassion. And guess what? Hundreds of years later, this promise comes to pass when the Messiah is born. And much to the shock of everyone, the first people to hear about it, it's a little surprising to me, is a group that you would not associate with nobility in receiving fantastic news. It was the shepherds. Look with me here in Luke chapter 2. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for some people. That's right. It will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ. He's the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. Okay, so there's the angel. Now more angels show up, okay? More angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I love the New King James Version, but check out the message translation because it doesn't disappoint. He says this, There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. Isn't that great? I love, I love how he brings that. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angels stood among them, and God's glory blazed around. Remember that word, blazed. Remember that. They were terrified. And the angel said, do not be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that's meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah. He's master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. All right, so can you picture it? So in a field, not far from Bethlehem, outside the, outside the city limits, there's a group of shepherds who are watching their flocks of sheep during the night. Now, be honest. When you think shepherds and you hear these terms, you immediately think back to your grade school or your preschool Christmas pageant, right? You always picture these cute little boys and girls. They, they didn't have much costume, so they wore a bathrobe or a scarf around their head. and Everybody's so happy. Unless, of course, you're the guy who gets picked to be the donkey, and he's, he's not very happy. But it could be worse, because in the pageant, you could end up being the camel who has to stand behind another dude who's probably sweating under that wool blanket and he's wearing the red Converse shoes there. Or you could be the angel here getting the side eye from these two over here. This is what we think of when we think of shepherds. God, it was nothing like that. As cute as they are, the shepherds in the ancient Near East were anything but cuddly. Shepherds back then were so looked down upon by most people. It wasn't nice. It wasn't proper. But they were often seen as the lowest of the low in Jewish society. I'm not talking about the Levitical ones or the Levite shepherds and stuff. I'm talking about the broader generic term of shepherd at that time. When you heard that word, you immediately assumed nomad. Nomad. They wander around. They smell. They camp by the fire. A bunch of single dudes. No kids. No girlfriends. And they're just roasting little s'mores, trying to stay up at night because they knew that the wolves could come around and pick off one of their sheep. So they didn't sleep well, they were cranky, they were fussy, they had to fight off wolves, and they had somebody on guard, and they were doing all kinds of stuff, just trying to keep their flock safe. It was a lonely life, but always hard work. They worked long hours. This was the blue collar of society. And so it is surprising to hear the birth announcement, the long awaited Messiah goes to kings? No. Goes to government? Goes to royalty? It goes to shepherds. And this confirms our first truth about peace this morning. The peace of Christ is for everyone. Aren't you glad it is? It's not for a little select group. It's not for a particular race. It's not for a particular socioeconomic. The amazing, shockingly cool here is that from the beginning of the Christmas story, we see hope, peace, joy, and love that arrive with the birth of Jesus. It isn't for the powerful. It's not for the, per the perfect. It's not for the priests. It was for the people, for everybody, everywhere. Anyone who will come under his lordship will know the prince of peace. So hear me. This is for the common person. If you are just hanging on by your fingertips, you're in good company. 
If you are just hanging on, just scratching and clawing to make it another day, the message of peace is for you. Bask in this. Soak it in. The angel of the Lord appears to these humble men out in the field. Check out their reaction. Their reaction is absolute terror. Notice it wasn't like, whoa, we got the message first. Or they weren't high five. It was none of that. The first reaction was absolute terror. Do you know why? They were fearful because the Shekinah glory of God, the glory of the Lord, suddenly shines all around them. And we forget, it's in the dead of night. In the dead of night. The closest thing I could think of, has anyone ever had the opportunity to see a rocket launch at night? Or maybe a space shuttle? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Y'all, it'll change your world. It is the most bizarre thing. You're sleepy, it's late, you have a night launch, and you've got your little lawn chair. And I remember, it's like 2 in the morning. But I please don't scrub this launch. I came out again. It's the third night. Will you please launch this rocket? Let's light this candle. And you're sitting there, 2 a.m., everybody's, you know, you're nodding. You're like, wake up. This is going to happen. And then you hear it. 10, 9, 8. You hear the distance. You see the countdown clock over on the Cape. It gets down to 1, and you hear nothing until a wave of sound pounds you in the chest. It's the rumble of thunder. You can feel it in the ground. The water even ripples. And then as the cannons ignite and it starts to go up in the air, it changes from nighttime to daylight. It is the most bizarre thing because notice what happens. The stars don't go away, yet it's as bright as noon. It's the most surreal thing. You know why? Because the sun in our daytime blinds out the sun, all these stars, right? But because this, the light is coming from the earth, from this rocket, this fake light, you can still see the stars. And you're sitting there, you're in your nasty pajamas, you got crumbs all over because you eat Cheez-Its and you're a slob, and all of a sudden, it's like somebody turned the lights on. And you're like, oh, hey, how are you? Where'd these hundreds of people come from? And it's broad daylight, and you feel naked. You're like, what is it? It plays with your head. And then it gets up high, and then whew, darkness comes again. Y'all, that's what I think of when I hear this glory of the Lord illuminated everything. This is kind of glory. But even that pales in comparison. It's this incredible thing. You want to hear something amazing? Here's your hidden gem for today. This is the first time in centuries that we see the Shekinah glory of God show up. Think about this. When you look at, remember they had the 400 missing years of silence? And then before that I was looking like, where, where's the last time? We, do you know the last time we see something this magnificent? You have to go all the way back to 1 Kings when Solomon is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And he brings it to the Holy of Holies, sets down, and it says the priests were ministering. This is a great time. And then the Shekinah glory of God comes in a cloud, and it fills the temple so much that the priests literally have to stop their ministry. I just feel like this holy vapor just descends, and there's this holy hush as they bask in the presence of the Lord. That's the Shekinah. Now do you see why they were terrified? This she- Shekinah glory shows up, and they're like, what is this? This hasn't shown up in years, and I love what the first words are to them. Do not be afraid. These are the words spoken over the ship. Guys, these are the same words the Lord is speaking over you right now. Do not be afraid. Y'all look around the world. You think there's some people who need to hear that? We live in a world that is full of such fear, such angst, such anxiety. It's off the charts. And we see this message, these words of peace, do not be afraid. So hear me. Wherever you are, I don't know if people come up, oh, you're talking to me. I don't know. Your financial situation, do not be afraid. Your bad diagnosis, do not be afraid. That painful, tough situation, that bad relationship, do not be afraid. What you are struggling with right now, that anxious circumstance that's swirling around you, the message still resonates. Do not be afraid. As followers of Christ, we are not people of fear. We are people of faith. Here's why. The angel brought good news. And it wasn't for some people. It was for every single one of us. They brought good news. Don't you just love it when someone comes up to you and declares loudly, I have good news and I have bad news. Right? You always know, right? And what do you want first? Tell me the bad, right? Tell me the bad. Let's just get it out of the way. Let's get it over with, right? And inevitably, they give you the good news. But you want the bad. You know why? Why is it that we do that? It's because when we still have good news, we still have hope. When we're holding on to that good news or something to hang on to, we know that there's still hope. 
And maybe today, somebody just needed to hear some good news. Because if you're being honest, your spirit is feeling anything but peace. That's okay. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in your game if you're feeling pain. It's okay. You're not alone. We go through these seasons, but the arrival of Jesus changes everything. Just like he's told to, to the people 2,000 years ago, you're still not alone. You're still not forgotten. In fact, I found something so cool, so profound this week. I, I called my wife, like, you got to see this. Get up here. We gotta, and I read this. It was in one of my study Bibles. I couldn't wait to share it with you. You ready? Get your cameras out. You're going to want to take a picture of this. One of my study Bibles says this. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, deity invaded humanity. Eternity invaded time. And royalty invaded poverty. Boom. Wrap your head around that. Isn't that great? Deity invaded you. Man, why can't I think of stuff like this? This is so good. I love this. It just brings Jesus right down into our y'all. He is the one your heart has been waiting for. Have you been pushing him out? Maybe this is new to you. Maybe you don't know the Lord at all and you're thinking, oh man, I want this. Hang on. I'm going to give you that chance. If you are waiting for all conflict and all stress to be gone from your life before you feel peace, it ain't going to happen. I hate to be the bearer of truth on that, but if you are waiting for everything to be perfect and no conflict, no stress before you feel peace, it will never happen. Not until the Prince of Peace returns and sets all things right. Which leads us to our next truth. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of God. That is so powerful. Be honest, how many times do we think, oh, if I could just get this crossed off my list, if I could just have peace with this relationship, if I could just get this done, oh, then I could take a breath and I would feel peace, right? Yeah, I, feel, I do. I do the same thing. I got my list. I'm like, if I could just, no, no, Matt, that's wrong. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. It's not when your wish list is all crossed off. It's being in the presence of God. There's a story told long ago of a wealthy man who was seeking to find the perfect picture of peace. I don't know if he lived in a castle or what, but apparently he had plenty of money, and he looked around at all the artworks that were available in his town, and he couldn't find one peaceful painting or artwork that satisfied him. So he said, you know what? I'll just do it myself. I'll announce a contest. And he had this huge contest. He sent out word. Couriers went all over the kingdom, and they challenged all artists and anyone who wanted to compete to compose the greatest painting of peace that they could find. And the message went out far and wide and in weeks. Paintings started to come in from all over. Finally, the great day of decision arrived, and he lined up these judges, and all the paintings were brought out into the town square, and each one was covered by a veil. And the judges would then go, and one by one, they would take the veil off the paintings, and the crowd would look, and they would gasp, and ooh, and awe. It was like one gorgeous, peaceful scene after another. And the crowd's like, oh, surely this is it. Oh, no, no, they'd unveil the next one. They're like, oh, that's amazing. How could they do that? And they go through all, and they're getting down to just a couple left. And not one of them was the winner yet. The king was looking. He's like, this is, this is not good. And the crowd began to grow restless. And the tensions grew. There's now two pictures left that are covered. And a judge goes up and he pulls the cover from one. And the story says a hush fell over the crowd. They looked at this stunning, mirror-smooth lake that reflected the green trees of the birches around in the soft red glow of the evening sky. And along the shore were were sheep that were grazing undisturbed. It was breathtaking, and surely they had found the winner. But a judge, just for kicks, decided to unveil the one remaining one. And the crowd wasn't silent. They gasped. They looked at each other nervously. One shouted out, is this some kind of joke? How is this scene anything but peaceful? You know what the scene was? It was a sloppily painted, raging waterfall coming off of jagged rocks. And it was cold, and there was a little bit of, of snow in the air. And there was all kinds of, of emotion in it. It looked like thundering clouds were starting to gather and threaten to bring wind and more rain and lightning. And in the midst of all the loud noise you could imagine, this bitter chill, there was this one gross-looking spindly tree growing at an awkward angle from the cliffside right up against the waterfall. 
And from this little tree was one branch that reached towards it, almost as if foolishly challenging it, like if I could just touch it, and it would have destroyed the tree. But as you zoomed in on the painting, there was a nest. And in that nest, the elbow of that branch, totally content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, was a mom bird peacefully resting on her eggs. Her eyes were closed and her wings were covering the eggs. And she was oblivious to the chaos around her. That's what I think of when I think of the peace in the middle of the storm or a peace that passes all understanding. Here's the truth, guys. Peace can be experienced in the middle of the chaotic. But you have to be walking with the Prince of Peace to make that your reality. You can't just ignore him. can't throw up a prayer for two seconds in the morning. I'm, I'm plugged in. I'm walking with you, Lord. I'll see you Sunday, baby. <laughs> it's not raining. The fish aren't biting. If Alabama's not playing late, whew. we've all been there. No shame. No guilt here. Unless God's convicting you, that's different. That's, that's on you and him, okay? When you think of God's peace, picture the Christ child. See, one of the things people forget, this is, such, this is another hidden gem, no charge. Luke is borrowing from a prophetic promise way back in Isaiah. Did you know that? He's borrowing from that promise. He's hearkening back to when they were looking forward to this beautiful time of peace under the reign of David. We kind of overlooked that, but y'all, David's reign was considered the good old days. You know how we look back like, oh, I wish I could live in my grandparents' days. I wish I could live up in the roaring 20s when everything was great and people had money and they were just, it was awesome. I'm like, no, 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 it was the 50s, the 50s. It was such an innocent time and like, you know, we had poodle skirts and like, that's what I idolized. That era, right? When music was really good. Our kids are going to look back, oh, I wish I could live in the 20s, the 2020s. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> truth is, everybody looks at has good old days. When Israel thought, this was their good old days. But here's the promise. This time, he's talking about a time that would be better than David. This time, the baby would be found wrapped in clothes in a manger. He would grow up and become the God of the universe who has invaded the neighborhood to live among them. What? Who does that? Who leaves their throne of glory to write themselves into a smelly stable? See, we're not talking about a mortal man. We're talking about the God-man, the divine. And as soon as the announcement is made, check out how the good news inspires that celebration. Look at verse 13 again. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The ESV translation says, On earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Oh, See, the amazing thing this declaration ends, it's saying peace will come to those on whom God's favor rests. And there it is. You want to know peace? Live and seek God's favor. And that's our final truth this morning. God's favor comes from being at peace with him. Speaking of peace, I got to tell you an awesome story that happened up here just this week. You all know every day up here, we have our preschool, and it is packed, and Leanne's done a fantastic job managing this. It has grown, and we're maxed out. There's dozens of kids up here, and I love sneaking over and hearing them in the hallways. And you can hear the laughter and the life, and you can hear them playing and bumping into walls and scuffing stuff up. And that's awesome. It's supposed to be that way. You can hear them just, just alive. But sometimes you hear crying. It's a little different. But sometimes there's, there's tears because we have a preschooler or two, or in this case, maybe three or four on this particular day, that didn't want mommy or daddy to leave to go to work. Most of you know that uh, Marin and, and Ruthie teach up there. And Marin was getting ready to go into in, in, to teach one of the classes, and Mercy was there. And Mercy was standing outside, and she wanted to give Marin a hug outside her preschool class before she went in for the day to teach. Here is the actual photo of that moment, okay? There was a couple of two, three, maybe four uh, two-year-olds, and they were crying. And evidently it was loud. And it was just, just around the corner, just, just, just to the left there. You could see and hear there were not some happy kids in there. And Mercy, during this hug, said, Marin, I hope you have the very bestest day. And then she peeked her head into the classroom and said, I don't think you're going to, but I hope <laughs> you do anyway. Isn't that awesome? 
don't think, five years old, she sees the lack of peace. Usually there's joy and stuff. Y'all, that is life. The Bible reveals to us, it doesn't matter about our circumstances. It doesn't matter about our relationship. If you want true and lasting peace, you have got to be related to a holy God. Now here's the rub, okay, because we always bring both sides of the coin here. Romans chapter 8 puts it rather bluntly. When we live according to the flesh, you will always have chaos. Your soul will always be tore up. Look at what verse 6 and 7 says. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting your spirit control your minds leads to life and, oh, there's that word, peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey, and it never will. So we find ourselves at odds with a holy God because until we are born again, until we have that, that atonement, we are living for just ourselves. Aren't we? Think about this. We're living to our flesh. We don't submit to him. We won't submit to him because we think our way is better. And we may not say that with our words, but that's how we live when we reject God's laws and what he wants, and we go our own way. We see it in nations. We see it in governments. We see it all around. When you choose your own, think about it, almost the origin of every conflict we face. Is it not because we think we know better? It's our pride. All the way back to the garden. Oh, I think I'm just going to try this. Every bit of tension comes because we're hurting each other because we think we know what's best. But thankfully, the Prince of Peace came in the form of a baby in a lowly manger. And the baby grew up to become a man. Spoiler alert. And he offered himself on a cruel cross to atone for my sin and for yours. Atone. By the way, that's just a fancy word saying bought, paid for, ransomed, washed. Substitutionary atonement is the actual terminology where it takes my sin and it puts it on Jesus. And it takes his righteousness and it's imputed to you and me. That's mind-blowing if you grasp that. That is our source of peace. When we know the Lord is supposed to change us, guys. It's supposed to reorient our heart. It literally makes us, who were once enemies with God, it now makes us friends. I love how First Peter says, he says this, God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. The ransom he paid wasn't mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Let me show you what this means in a real modern life example that happened not long ago. In fact, we'll, we'll park here. I'm going to go ahead and have our instrumentalists come up. Anybody remember the movie came out a while back called The Case for Christ with Pastor Lee Strobel? Awesome pastor, great guy, making movies. He's a former, I think, lawyer and attorney, and he just has this great apologetics genius mind. He was pastoring a church, and he shares this true story about a little eight-year-old girl who had just been caught in the very act of shoplifting. Okay, so she was shoplifting. The reason they caught her was because in his mega church in the front lobby, they have this huge bookstore. And they can go in for church and look at stuff. Apparently, there was a book there that caught her eye. And so this eight-year-old girl is in the store, and she steals. And the person who catches her went to Pastor Lee privately and said, Hey, listen, will you represent the church so that she can come to somebody for accountability and apologize and try to make it right? He said, absolutely, I will. In fact, I have an idea. Bring her and her parents into my office, set up an appointment. The next day, the parents and the eight-year-old daughter came into his office and sat down. Here's what happened next. He looked at her and said, sweetie, tell me what happened. The little girl was still scared, but as gently as I could, I leaned in. And she said, well, sir, and she started to sniffle. I saw a book, and I really, really wanted it, but I didn't have any money. He said, now the tears started to form in her eyes and a few spilled down her cheeks. So I handed her some tissues from my desk. So I, I put the book under my coat and I hid it and I took it. I know it was wrong. I know I shouldn't do it, but I did. And I'm here to say I'm sorry and I promise I will never do it again. He leaned in and he said, sweetie, I am so glad you are willing to admit what you did and also to own up to it and say you're sorry. That's very brave of you, and it's the right thing to do. But I have to ask, whoo, what do you think the appropriate punishment should be? 
her eyes got wide. She was silent. She just shrugged her shoulders. So Pastor Lee Strobel thought for a moment. And then he leaned closer and he says, I understand that the book you stole cost $5. I think it would be at least fair for you to pay the bookstore those $5. But because of this, I think three times that amount, which would make your total $20, is fair enough. What do you think? She thought about it a moment. She nodded. And she sadly said, yes, sir, that sounds fair. She saw the fairness in it, but now fear came into her eyes. You can see what she was thinking. $20? I'm eight years old. I don't have a job. Where can I? That might as well be a, a million dollars. Where do I get that mountain of cash? And then Lee says this. He says, knowing I was about to use this moment to teach her something about Jesus, I opened my desk drawer and I removed my checkbook and I wrote out a check from my personal account for the full amount that she owed. I tore off the check and I held it out to her so she could see it. Her mouth dropped open. Sweetie, I'm going to pay your full penalty so you don't have to. You know why I do that? No, sir. It's because I love you. Because I care about you. And you are valuable. And he whispered. And that is exactly how Jesus sees you. But even more. She took that check. He said, I wish you could be there, guys, to see the absolute look of relief. The, the look of joy and wonder that just washed over her face. She was almost giddy with gratitude. That is exactly, on a much grander scale, what God did. He wrote a check, guys, on our behalf. When we sinned against him, that check was for far more than $20. No, no monetary amount would match the value. And it was paid for with his precious blood. So maybe you're here today. You don't know that. Maybe you want to know that peace. Maybe you want to know that kind of saving forgiveness. You can. God has freely offered it. Maybe the chaos around you has taken your peace and you just want to rededicate your heart and your mind and the privacy of your seat. In just a moment, we'll stand and sing. The altar will be open. Maybe you just want to come and kneel. No one will mess with you. You can come and kneel and just do business with God. Pour out your heart. Maybe you want to meet him for the first time. You can do that. In fact, right where you are, why don't you just bow with me? Tune out the distractions as we close our eyes. If you want this peace and you haven't had it, just tell the Lord in your own words. Just be straight, open, honest with him. Jesus, I need your peace. Tell him. God, I need that peace that only you can give and that you freely offer. I invite you as I surrender to come be my ruler, my Lord, my Redeemer. In this moment, Lord, I confess, I agree with you that I have sinned. And that sin has separated me. I'm sorry that I've been at odds with you and lived my own way. Forgive me. God, allow me to receive your favor, your saving grace. I surrender right now in this moment to your perfect will. I repent of my sin. I turn my back 180 degrees on it and I renounce my sinful ways. And I want to walk after your righteousness. God, make me an instrument of your peace in this world. Help me to reflect your love. Thank you for the promise that all who call on your name will be saved. We confess you as Lord. We believe in our heart. You are raised from the dead. Thank you for being our Savior, our Messiah, our Redeemer, our Lord. In Jesus' name, we're able to pray. Amen.